Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining me. I know it was last minute when I put up the post that I would be going live tonight. Um, welcome to everybody that's already on here. Haley, hey Haley, nice to see you again. Stephanie, I think I've had a couple Stephanies. I want to say you're the same one that was on before, right, Stephanie? Lizbeth was very early. Capricia. Amore from Arizona. Amor says she's taking her CCMA June 3rd and she's going to externship on June 6th. Wow. Okay, Amor. So I'm glad you're here then tonight. Um, I hope you got a chance to watch those other videos. If you haven't, make sure you do. And I'm I'm really hoping that my sessions are helping you. Please let me know how how things go when you take your test next week. Next week. Um, yeah, well, what is yeah, next week? Yeah. Um Let's see. Um, Capricia says she's watching from Indiana. Okay, she's currently in externship. Have you taken your test yet, Capricia? Or are you preparing for your test? Hey, Sade. Oh, Lizbeth, you said CMA. Okay, got you. Okay, Lizbeth is from Dallas, Texas, and she's doing the CMA test on June 3rd. Got you. Sade's taking hers on May 31st. Excellent. So I'm really hoping that these sessions are helping you all. Thank you so much for being on here. Um, I was last minute because um, like I, I put up a post early and I mentioned that um, my I have a new class that I started next week. I've been off the, for the past month or so in between semesters. So I, I've had time. But once my new class starts next week, I won't have a lot of time. So I wanted to make sure I got on here and did a couple videos. So what I'm going to do. Um, tonight, uh, we'll do the CCMA and then Thursday, for those of you that's taking the CMAA, I will, um, be doing that, uh, maybe on Wednesday or Thursday and I'll post that as well. So look out for that. Um, let's see who else we have on here. Oh yeah. Amor said, yes, that's why I'm here. Okay. She, she said they, um, I've come across some of your questions from the previous videos and my, yes. So yeah, Amor, um, these, the, the questions that I go over, these are literally the exam questions. Um, I'm not the exam questions. I'm sorry. The practice test questions that I get from the NHA website. So I try to put a little spin on some of them and, and word them differently, but the material I get from, um, NHA, um, website, um, Okay, Miss uh, Haley says she should be taking an exam in 30 days of retake again. Okay. Um, okay, she says study stock is also a great source. Thank you. Let me make a note of that to look into that. Thank you, Amor. Study stock. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't see Amor, put a, another resource in the comments. Let me make a note somewhere to look into that really quickly before I forget. Look into um study stock okay i will definitely look into that thank you amore um oh mary says she started her externship today 10 hours monday through thursday oh she roamed 13 patients today already overwhelming but interesting taking my cma exam in august got you okay she did some lab work wow mary so you did a lot on your first day um sometimes in with your externship they kind of ease you in and have you do administrative stuff at first so that's good that they that they threw you right on in there because I've had some um, students who are frustrated because they didn't get to do anything right away. So that's good. That's that's really good. And I got a video coming up. Um, I'm going to try to record it this week. I want to get all my videos recorded this week while I have time. Um, so I want to do um, one on externship do's and don'ts. So look out for that. Um, I'll record it this week and probably post it next week. All right, let's see. So we're going to get ready to get started. Um, thank you all again, like I mentioned, for getting on. I know this was last minute. Um, but I'm happy to see some of you all again. Some of you are on here every single time I go live with these study sessions. So I appreciate you all. And I'm happy to be of help. Um, so first of all, I want to congratulate everybody on passing their test. I'm going to show. Um, let's see. Uh, let me go to my screen here. I want to shout out some people. So if you've been on my study videos before, you know, I like to shout out people that pass. So I want to shout out um, Dallas here, Susie. Ari, Miranda, Denise, Rabbit Lover. These are all people who have passed their test. Now, this time, it, I had a whole bunch of um, people at one time. So I actually, on the next slide, there's more people. One thing I want to mention, too, is that this person said they took their CMAA. This person said they took their CMA. I will tell you all this. So you all know I focus on the CMAA and CCMA, but I've had some students who told me that my videos have also helped with the CMA and the RMA as well. 
which is great, but I want to stress the importance of looking at those study materials as well. So if you're taking the RMA or the CMA and you're watching my videos, that's fine. But please do not, um, please do not rely on these videos only. Yes, some of the material is the same, but some of it is not. So please also um, make sure you're looking at that information as well, okay? Um, CCMA, Ashanti, Yvette. Um, oh, I love this. I love this right here because Yvette, she did not pass the first time. She passed the second time, which is fine. I've had several people who have had to take the test two, three times before they pass. And it happens. That is not uncommon. So if that is you, if you're on here tonight, if you've taken a test before and you didn't pass, it's okay. Just recognize those areas where you fell short and go for it again. Please um, um, make sure you're reaching out to your school as well to get some resources, okay? Ask them how can they help. Um, another person, CCMA. Um, I don't want to say the wrong. I don't know if it's DI, DI. I'm so sorry if you're watching and I mispronounced that. Lily. Um, as, uh, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce, um, is Shanette. I'm not, I'm sorry. Um, Katarina. Um, so, um, the last two I wanted to say for last, because they, both of them made some really good points. So Q says, um, the NHA study guide needs to be updated because I thought, um, because I think I'm the only person that thought it was hard. I was like, Lord have mercy. I'm going to fail because the wording of the questions was very tricky. I had to use process of elimination with majority. Lena says she got it and she says, you are right. The questions are different. If you need to pass the test, you must review all the content. I wanted to say theirs for last because they both made a really good um, a really good um, point about the wording being tricky, right? She says that the NHA study guide needs to be updated. And the reason why she feels this way is because the questions are not the same. This is one of the reasons why I stress the importance. And this is going to take me to uh, my tips before we get started. You want to make sure, first of all, that your life is revolving around the study materials, right? Um, another thing, um, I'll just go through all of these. Um, so join medical assistant groups on Facebook. Those will help. Pay close attention to the wrong answers on a practice test. Do not focus more on the questions. So that's the point that I wanted to get to. Make sure you're focusing on the actual content and not the questions itself, okay? Like Lena said, she noticed that um, the content was there, but the questions were not, especially for those of you that's not even taking a CCMA or CMAA. Focus on the content. And when I say pay attention to the wrong answers, I'll give you an example as we go through the practice test tonight of what I mean by that. Create flashcards and have a family member or friend quiz you. Um, use process of elimination when you're actually taking the test, even with your practice test. But when you're taking your test and your practice test, Eliminate those things that you know are absolutely incorrect. And then with the practice test, as well as the actual test, um, let me try to get that to this. There we go. Okay. Answer that thing was in a way. Answer each, answer your easy questions first. Okay. Then you want to flag your difficult questions to come back to later. And the reason why I say this is because when you go to take the actual test, you get three hours. You don't want to with the CCMA and CMA anyway, CMAA anyway. I don't I, I can't remember what it is for RMA and CMA, but you only get three hours flag. And, and that sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not. So flag the difficult questions, right? Fly through the easy ones first and then flag the difficult ones. So that way you can come back to it and you can, um, you know, spend a little bit more time on those. OK, so those are just a few tips. Feel free to screenshot this. Um, I. Um, tend to add to these um, each time. So yeah, so congratulations to everybody that passed. If and when you pass your test, make sure you also send me a um, you know, comment, let me know you passed, so that way I can shout you out as well. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I need to go forward. So this is your first time um, on here with me tonight. The way it works is that I go through the question, I ask the question, and I give you all a few moments to put the answers in the chat box. If you get an incorrect, that's fine. This is what this is for. So I don't want anybody feeling embarrassed or anything if they get the wrong answer wrong. It happens. Trust me. This is what the practice um, sessions are for. Okay. So I just want you to answer to the best of your ability and use process of elimination. All right. Which of the following is an appropriate way to confirm a patient's identity? Ask the patient to state and spell their full name and provide their date of birth. Ask the patient for their provider's name. 
ask the patient to state their age and address, or ask the patient to verify their examination room number. Which of the following is the appropriate way to confirm a patient's identity? I see, Lizbeth, you said you're nervous. It is perfectly normal to be nervous, Lizbeth. It is perfectly fine. Um, I understand. But like I said, keep the information in front of you. Let your life revolve around this information up until it's time for you to take your test. So I, I understand. All right. So I see the majority of you are saying A. Let's see. And you're correct. So you want to ask the patient to state and spell their full name and date of birth. So when you're um, verifying your patient, um, I wanted to just kind of stress the importance of letting them state their name. Don't ever say, hey, is your name um, Murray Jones and your date of birth, you know, 7777. Don't say it for them because if the patient is hard of hearing, they will say yes. Years ago, I remember I called the patient to the back and um, it was she was an older, a older patient. And um, she came back and it turned out that she wasn't even the patient I was calling. She was hard of hearing. And so she thought I called her name. My actual patient was in the bathroom. Once I brought her to the back and had her verify her name and date of birth, that's when I realized she was the wrong patient. But if I had stated her name and date of birth for her, she, because she was elderly, she, she barely could hear me, she probably would have said, yes, that's me. So always let them state it, okay? Of course, their provider's name and um, it's not going to verify them. Address is unnecessary, name and date of birth. Um, and then, of course, the exam room number. So some of these questions and answers, it's going to be common sense to you. You're going to know, OK, that doesn't make any sense. You'll be able to eliminate those. And then sometimes it's going to come down to to two answers and then you got to kind of work your way from there. All right. You're welcome, Lizbeth. All right. Which of the following is an appropriate? Oh, I went back. I'm sorry. I don't know why I keep going backwards. Sorry about that. All right. When you need to remove all living microorganisms from an instrument, which of the following methods should you use? Disinfection, sanitization, sterilization, or ultrasonic? An instrument that has been used and you need to clean it. Are you going to disinfect it, sanitize it, sterilize it, or are you going to um, use an ultrasonic method? Let's see. Let's see. I see the majority of you all are choosing C. Okay. Let's see. Hey, Mimi, good to see you back here. Let's see. For those of you that said C, you are correct. So sterilization. So sterilization. Oh, and this is an example of what I meant when I said pay attention to the wrong answers, right? Um, so what I mean by that is so the answer was not disinfection, sanitation, or ultrasonic, but make sure you know what those things mean. Why? Because when you go to take your test, if it's an option on a practice test, it's probably going to be something that's going to be on the actual test. So make sure you know what those wrong answers mean as well, okay? Um, like disinfection. So disinfection does not kill all microorganisms. It'll kill some, but not all. And some of them, they don't even kill. They just um, render them inactive like they don't kill them but they can't really do anything but they're not all dead right sanitization it just reduces the number of microorganisms so sanitation is like the least um and when you think of like cleaning methods sanitation is like just that first step you know how you all use hand sanitizer when you can't get to the sink necessarily to wash your hands that's what sanitizing does it's just a a, a momentary fix really um if you can't wash your hands. So when you're sanitizing something, you're really just reducing the number of microorganisms. And then ultrasonic, that's a form of disinfectant, um, um, but it's not sterilization. All right. Let me make sure I go forward this time and not backwards. All right. Which of the following should occur before a patient signs an informed consent? The medical assistant should explain the procedure to the patient. The medical assistant should describe the risk of the procedure. The patient, the provider should review alternative procedures with the patient or the provider should review the patient's insurance coverage for the procedure. 
Oh, you're welcome, Mimi. You're welcome. I'm I'm happy to help. I'm happy to see you back here. Evelyn, you've been with us before, right? I, your name looks familiar. I think you've been with us before, unless I'm just thinking about from the comments. Okay, so I see A, I see C. I'm seeing A and C so far. Let's see. All right, so I'm seeing a mix of A and C. All right, so it looks like it looks like everybody has ruled out B and D pretty much because it looks like everybody is coming down to A and C. Um, oh, Evelyn said this is her first time. Okay, Evelyn. All righty. Nice to have you here. Okay, let's see. All right. So those of you that chose C, you're correct. Let's talk about why it's not A. So it says the medical assistant should explain the procedure. The reason why that's not the answer is because that is the provider's job to explain the procedure. Now, the provider will give us instructions to give to the patient, to, to go over with the patient, but it's, it's outside of our scope to explain the procedure. Unless the doctor says, hey, I'll use one of you as an, as an example. Unless the doctor says, hey, Leisha, go in there and explain to this patient, you know, such and such. Then we can explain. But other otherwise, um, it's the doctor's job. Looks like you all knew that we it is outside of our scope to describe the risk and, and, and benefits of the procedure. And you also knew that it's not the provider's job to review the patient's insurance coverage. However, the provider should review alternative procedures. That is the provider's job. We cannot, as a medical assistant, whether clinical or administrative, it is outside of our scope to review alternative procedures with the patient. Okay, that is the provider's job. All right. Okay, so which of the following conditions refer to curvature of the thoracic spine? Lordosis, subluxation, I can never say that word, kyphosis, or scoliosis? Give you guys a few moments. Let's see, I see A, I see the majority are saying D. Okay, so let's see, looks like A and D. All right, so the answer is going to be kyphosis. Let's talk about this for a minute. So um, keyword is thoracic spine. So um Kyphosis is curvature of the thoracic spine. Let's talk about the spine for a second. So we got the cervical spine, which is um, the neck area, right? Then thoracic, that's the upper back. And then, of course, the lung, well, thoracic is more like the like the mid to upper back. And then lumbar is the um, lower back. So lordosis is actually um, the curvature of the lumbar spine, the lower back, okay? And again, make sure you know what these other ones mean. Um, so that way, if you see it on the test, you know. So lordosis, that's the curvature of the lumbar spine. That's also called um, sway back, okay? Um, subluxation, that's the, um, what is, uh, that's the dislocation of a joint, actually. Subluxation is the dislocation of a joint. And then um, scoliosis, that is also a curvature of the spine, but it's the curvature, it's the lateral spine, so like the side. So the difference between the two, like I said, the kyphosis is of the thoracic spine, okay? Um, and then usually um, scoliosis usually comes from um, one hip being higher than the other one, okay? So I understand why most people would have chose scoliosis. I probably would have um, went there myself if I didn't know what kyphosis was. Um, Lizbeth, never say you don't know. Take the time to think about it. And if it's really not clicking, choose the best answer. That sounds right. Yep, that's true. So, yep, that is true. That's true. 
always take a guess. So when you all go take this test, for those of you, some of you all are taking the next week, week after, make sure you, I mean, well, I don't even know if it lets you stop without choosing something, but if you have to guess, you know, some of this, you're just going to have to guess, you know, using process of elimination first, and then, you know, try, try to choose something, you know, um, at least you have a chance of getting it right as opposed to leaving it blank. All right. Um, let's see. When educating an older patient, which of the following ensures patient understanding? Speak louder to the patient, stand beside the patient, have additional medical staff present to explain information, or have the patient repeat information? You got this, Lizbeth. You know more than you think you know. Okay, I see some answers rolling in. I see mostly D's. I see an A. Let's see. All right, let's see. All righty. So, yes, you want to have the patient repeat information. So, I will tell you all this, and um, I've, I've said it a couple times before. Whenever you come to these questions, I was asking the best way to demonstrate patient understanding, the best way to make sure that they that they understand and they got it is to have them repeat the information. You may also see a question um, where the answer is have them to demonstrate it. If the patient can repeat it back to you or demonstrate it, that's the best way to ensure that the patient understands, okay? Speaking loud or standing beside the patient, we can probably ensure they hear us, but it doesn't ensure that they understand. Having a different medical, the additional medical staff, again, we can present the information with a hundred of us in the room, but that doesn't mean that the patient understands. But if they can repeat it back to us or demonstrate it, then we know they understand. All right. A patient requests a female provider due to religious convictions, but there isn't one available. Which of the following is an appropriate response? The decline treatment of the patient assist the patient in locating the provider to accommodate the patient's needs, reassure the patient that the male provider will be respectful or instruct the patient to visit an emergency room. So this patient has um, religious convictions and she wants to see a female provider. What, what is your um, response to that? How would you respond? Okay, look like everybody's saying B, let's see. Yes, this is correct, this is correct. Um, I will tell you this, you'll have a lot of these scenario questions. And as I always say, the scenario questions, they are always gonna be, um, you know, the best, most professional answer, right? So we definitely not gonna decline treatment. We're not gonna reassure the patient that the male provider will be respectful, that's forcing that male provider on the patient when she already has religious convictions, right? And we're not going to turn her away to tell her to go to the emergency room, but we will assist her in locating the provider to accommodate her needs. Okay. Very good. Looks like so far we got ladies. So I can say ladies. So very good ladies. All right. Which of the following forms indicate when a patient needs a referral and or follow-up appointments and counter form CMS 1500, OSHA Form 301 or um, informed consent. Okay, looks like the majority of you are saying A. Let's see. And you all are correct. This is the encounter form. It's the encounter form. Um, CMS 1500, that's the claim form. That's what we fill out um, to send to an insurance company. We'll send a copy of the encounter form with that form. Um, the OSHA form, that's the form that we use to um, 
to document um, any incidents that might happen. Like if you have like an injury, we'll use that form. Um, and then the informed consent, um, inf the informed consent form, that's what the patient signs with. They're having a procedure. They're signing that they understand the risk and benefits of that procedure, right? They understand that it may or may not work, right? So make sure you know what all of those forms mean, again, just in case you see them on the test. All right, when performing a finger stick, which of the following should happen first? Cleanse the site with an antiseptic wipe, select the appropriate part of the third or fourth finger, position a blade of the lancet across the lines of the fingertip, or confirm the correct identity of the patient. Okay, looks like the majority, it looks like everybody's saying D. All right, and you all are correct. The answer is D. So you want to always, always, always confirm the identity of the patient first. When you see these questions, even though this uh, these other things will do eventually, keyword is first. So look out, that's one thing I keep forgetting to add to the tips. Look out for keywords in the questions first, initially priority, you know, things like that. That's the key word. What should happen first? We always want to identify the patient first and make sure we have the correct patient. All right, which of the following is an appropriate statement when a patient is irate about a claim denial? That's not our fault. Your insurance company has several rules about what they cover and don't cover. I don't take care of those matters. You'll have to call our billing department. That kind of thing eventually happens to everyone. If the balance isn't at large, it's better to just pay it than to try to fight with them. Let's see if there's something we can do at our end. I'll ask our claim specialist to review the claim. Okay, Capricia said it tripped her up because it said when performing. So good, so 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 good point. So Capricia, even in situations like that, um, think about um, like when you see a question like that, like even though all those other things will do. Think about something that we absolutely must do. Like, yeah, we got to do those, but we absolutely have to confirm because we can't do any of that before we confirm the patient anyway. Like anything we do, vital signs, injections, anything, we have to always confirm the patient first. But I get it. Um, I see. So I see D so far. The patient is irate. Like they're angry. They got a denial. Their insurance company is not trying to cover it. Everybody says D. You're welcome, Capricia. Yep, that's correct. Let's see if something is, let's see if there's something we can do on our end. Everything else is unprofessional. That's not our fault. What? We can't say that. Even if it's not our fault, we can't say that to the patient. I don't care if those matters. That kind of thing eventually happens to everyone. It's better to just pay it. I think we all can look at those and tell that those are inappropriate to say to our patients. So believe it or not, some questions will be this easy <laughs> on the test. Again, don't look for this exact question, but some scenario questions you will be able to look at and just know right away. And those are the type of questions that you want to, you know, get out the way in the beginning, right? Questions like this, you want to fly through. All right. So, yeah, you will have some easy questions like this. Don't don't be too nervous and think every question is going to be hard because it's not. You'll have some simple ones thrown in there. All right. Oxycodone is which type of medication? Is it a schedule one control substance with a low potential for abuse? Is it a schedule five with a high potential schedule four with a low potential or is it a schedule two with a high potential? Oxycodone. This is a well, all of it is important, but it is important for you to know these schedules. OK, so this is something um, I just want to confirm. First of all, everybody here, you all are on the clinical side, right? Because I do know that I get some some of you are on the administrative side, because um, if you don't already know, I do teach both the clinical and the administrative side. So I know I get some administrative people. So anybody, um, everybody here is pretty much clinical, right? If there's anybody administrative, let me know. Because I know you, some of this you wouldn't know if you're administrative. If you're taking a CMAA, I know you wouldn't know this. 
Okay, Shad Shadira said, yeah, she's clinical. Okay, everybody is pretty much clinical. Okay. Okay, so yeah, definitely those of you, those of uh, you that are clinical medical assistants, make sure you know these schedules. Okay, let's see what we got here. Looks like the majority of people are saying D. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right, yes. Yeah, so you looks like y'all, yeah. So y'all know y'all stuff. Y'all are killing it tonight. So yes, um, oxycodone that is a schedule um two drug um. So let's talk about these other ones here. Uh, fentanyl is also an example of a Schedule Two drug. So Schedule One, Schedule One is those drugs that's just not acceptable for medical use at all. That's like heroin, um, ecstasy, um, marijuana. Even though it is considered a medical drug now, is used for medical purposes. It is still a Schedule One drug. Maybe they'll update it eventually, but it is still considered a Schedule One drug. Um, I mentioned Schedule 2. Um, examples of Schedule 4 could be like um, Valium. Um, schedule 5 um, could be um, like Robitussin uh, or even like a cough cert with codeine in it. So these this, these are important to familiarize yourself with it if you haven't. Okay, so Mimi is, is on the administrative side. Okay, Mimi, you're still doing good. You still know this. Um, are you saying your future, like you're going to do that in the future, or that's what you're taking now, um, the administrative side? But you're still doing good, though, with these clinical questions. Um, Amor said it's good to watch your administrative videos as well because they say the administrative and law and ethics part has been tricky for some. That is true, Amor. If you're on the clinical side, watch the CMAA videos as well because you do get some some um, administrative questions as well. So that's a good point. Um, Shadira says, I definitely watched administrative videos because when I did a practice test, those were the ones, oh yes, that she kept getting wrong. And I'm glad you mentioned that Shadira because it's very important to, um, to make sure you make a note of those areas where you know you fall short. So ladies and gentlemen, if I have any gentlemen on here, make sure those areas where you fall in short, let those be your 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 focus areas, right? When you take, if you for those of you who have the study guide, it'll show you your weak areas. You'll see something that says like focus review, and it'll show you those areas where you fell short. Um, Haley says, Miss K, is it thirty days to retake the NHA exam after taking a test? Um, thirty days, yes, thirty days, yes. Um, I think the CMA. If, it depends on which one. Yeah, with NHA, yes, because that's a CCMA. You can 30 days. And then I know CMA, you can take it right out. You're like, I think it's CMA. You can schedule that one right away. Um, Mimi says she's finishing January 23rd, Ultimate Medical Academy. Okay, got you. Okay, got you. So you're about to be administrative assistant, the a medical administrative. Yeah, but you're doing really good with these clinical questions. Lizbeth says she needs EKG practice. Um, Lizbeth, thank you for mentioning that. I've had a few people to ask me to do um, EKG practice tests, but I don't um, I don't teach EKG besides teach a medical assistant and they do learn a little bit about it. But um, the EKG course, that's not something that I teach, but I can do like a quick little video of like, you know, how to, um, you know, read heart rate and, and, and how to, um, um, how to um, read certain things on the EKG. But as far as the course, I've had a few people asking about that. I don't teach that. I would search videos on that. They do have the practice test on NHA you could buy for EKG. All right, so let's keep it moving. How many millimeters of medication are in a um, tablespoon? Are in a tablespoon. That actually should be milliliters. I'm sorry. That says millimeters. That should say milliliters. What is it? That should say milliliters. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. That should say miller. What is it? M milliliters? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Millimeters is a form of, um, is a, a, a measurement of distance, right? All right, someone says A. Okay, so you said EKG was your problem. Yeah, if you have access to NHA, Lizbeth, I would um look into getting those practice tests and that study guide for EKG. They have that there. They have phlebotomy. They have everything on NHA. 
And I'll be honest with you, Lizbeth, EK, I think EKG, that was something I struggled with in school back in 2004 when I was in school. EKG and um, what else did I struggle with? EKG and the math is what I struggled with back in school. So I, I get it. All right, everybody says A. And that is correct. 15 milliliters. That is correct. Sorry about that typo on here, ladies. All right. So let's see. How should you put a seven-year-old at ease prior to administering, administering an injection? Show the needle that will be used for the procedure. Use medical terminology when discussing the procedure with the child. Tell the child that the procedure will not hurt or explain the procedure to the child in simple steps. Are oh, you on week with medical transcription and biology? Good luck with that, Mimi. Um, is there, um, oh, Lizbeth said there's a video that I follow for EKG. Yeah, Haley, list that video for Lizbeth if you have it. Um, if you're able to provide a link, you can leave that there as well. All right, so looks like everybody's saying D. Another one of those questions where I feel like you can kind of look at it and say, you know what? I know I'm not going to show the child that needle. If anything, you want you want to hide the needle. Children and anybody that's afraid of needles, try not to let them see the needle, okay? Using medical terminology, we can rule that out. You never want to use medical terminology when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with your patients, period, because you want to assume they don't know it. And definitely not with a child. Never tell a child that it won't hurt. You know what I do when I'm talking to kids? I'll say, they'll say, is it going to hurt? I'm, I just say, it'll, it's just going to be really quickly. I never say no because you don't want to lie and then you lose their trust. So they're like, is it going to hurt? I'm like, it's going to be really quick. You know, explain them in simple steps. I'm going to get your arm. I'm going to squeeze it and it's going to be really quick. You got to kind of be animated and, you know, really kind of, um, and you'll get a feel for the child, you know, but you want to be kind of animated with them and, you know, talk them through it and make them laugh and, you know, get them comfortable, get them to trust you. Um, Amor said, it's really how they ask where are the placements, like they'll switch with lead, which lead is a left of the mid axillary to the form in the costal space, LOL. <laughs> um, so I do have a video on here with the chest lead placements. I don't know if that will help. Um, it's it's um, EKG placement, the chest leads. I didn't do the limb leads because those are pretty easy, the arms and legs. But I did a chest lead video. I don't know if that will help. Um, Lizbeth said, yes, please, Haley. Patrine, hey, Patrine, I feel like I, I, I know you've been here before. Oh, Patrine says she she did a CMA, CMA and pass. Congratulations, Patrine. She passed the CMA. I know I I'm like I know that name. I've seen you a couple times. Um, congratulations, Patrine. I'm gonna shout you out on my next video. When this posts, make sure you comment it in the um in the comment section so I can um shout you out. Hey, Shalandra. Here's another regular. Hey, Shalandra's. Shalandra's here. Katrina is here. Those are my regulars. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. Pediculosis is what type of infection? Is it a fungal infection, bacterial, parasitic, or helminthic? Pediculosis. Is it a fungus, a bacteria, a parasite, or a helminth? Another example of making sure you know what all of these mean. Pediculosis. All right, I'm seeing some mixed answers here. I'm seeing C, R, C, A, R, C, D. Okay, I see B, see mixed answers here. So definitely, because I'm seeing mixed answers, this is definitely letting me know you ladies want to definitely make sure, um, want to make sure you know what these are. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and see what the answer is. 
All right, so pediculosis is a parasite. What is pediculosis? Pediculosis is lice. Okay, you have you have, have you ever heard of lice? Um, lice, um, you know, a lot of people get can get that. It's very contagious. Um, they attach to hair, whether it's hair on your head or even pubic lice. And pubic lice is another name for well, crabs is another name for pubic lice. Have you ever heard of crabs? That's what pediculosis is. Um, fungal infections that is a um a, you know yeast is an example of fungus um bacteria um like cellulitis or um even acne um and then hail mints we talked about that on the last video an example of hail mints are tapeworms so make sure you know those because you will see these on not necessarily all of them but you want to know all of them just in case you see it Oh, Haley says she forgot this one. She says she forgot that one. All right, let's see. Which of the following increases circulation before a finger stick? Holding a patient's hand above his heart, squeezing a patient's finger, warming a patient's hand, apply a tourniquet above the patient's wrists. I'll be right back. Hold on one second. I have my daughter right here. Hold on one moment. I'm going to go on mute for one moment. Okay, I'm back here. Okay, looks like the majority is everybody saying C, C, ringworms too, right? Is helminths the same thing? No, um, Emily, ringworms are, um, ringworms is actually fungus. Um, helminths are, um, an example of helminths are tapeworms. I, I wasn't sure if you meant are helminths the, the same as what, a more. But ringworms are caused by fungus as opposed to um, it's, it's, it's not a parasite like um, like those little tiny um, bugs are like um, that lice is not the same. All right, let's see. I see B. All right, so is are those C's from, oh, okay, this is from this question, okay. Let's see, I'm sorry, ladies. All right, so warm the patient's hand, that is correct. So holding the patient's hand above his heart, that's not gonna do anything. Squeezing a patient's finger, so no, um, it looks like everybody, um, or, well, I did see a couple B's on here, but no, if anything, you don't squeeze the patient's finger. If anything, you do what's called milking where you kind of you're not squeezing a patient's finger but you're rubbing it you're you're milking um the finger meaning you're trying to you're you're pushing the blood flow towards the um the end of the, the tip of the finger and then applying a tourniquet no we're not going to apply the tourniquet above the wrist for a finger stick if we're drawing blood from the patient's hand then yeah we'll put a tourniquet on the patient's wrist but not for a finger stick so i've had patients where their hands were really cold um, and we just try to get the patients to run their hands under warm water for a few minutes and then come back. Or um, when I worked for LabCorp, we actually had warmers that the patient could hold um, that we would have them um, put on their hands for a few minutes, especially when we had like infants. Um, we would put those little warmers um, on the infant's um, foot as well. All righty. Um, Good question. More uh, parasites. Are you asking if um hell? So you know what? It's it's weird because hell mems are, um, because um like tapeworms are are somewhat of a par are a parasite. Yeah, they are kind of similar, but 
um um i forgot what the question was now hold on let me go back real quick oh lice okay yeah lice so yeah li lice is definitely those little tiny bugs are definitely parasites but yeah hell mimps are a type of um parasite as well um a more that's a good question um so though uh, uh another reason to make sure that we all that you all are you know reading up on these making sure you know what each of these are and examples are just in case you see these on the test okay all right which of the following instruments are necessary for a pap test cryoprobe sin retractor cytobrush or ads and forceps All right, let's see. I see C and I see D. Let's see what the answer is. All right, so cytobrush. So cytobrush. So yeah, for pap smear, if you're setting up for pap, you're going to use a cyto. You're going to put out a um, cytobrush. Cryoprobes are used with cryosurgery. Um, Sim retractor. Those those little instruments that look like a fork. And for those of you that's learning instruments, you know what I mean. Um, it holds tissue open during um, procedures and then adds and forceps. Anytime you see forceps, forceps are usually used to grasp, grasp something like tissue. So that's what forceps are used for. All right. When, uh, which of the following documentation templates is organized by the entity that supplied the data? Source-oriented, problem-oriented, SOAP format, or chatter format? Sometimes I get confused on which answers are with where the answers start once I look away. Let's see. I'm thinking it's starting at, uh, let's see. Um, I see A's and I see C's. I see A and C so far. All right, so let's see. Again, one of those questions where you want to make sure you pay attention to the wrong answers as well because you'll see them on the test. So that's going to be the source oriented medical record or S O M R. So if you see S O M R source oriented medical record, that's what this, that's what that is there. Um, it's organized by the entity that supply data. Okay. Um, problem oriented. Um, let's see what's the best way to, um, explain that. So problem oriented medical record or P O M R, um, is broken out. It has four sections. It has the problem list. Um, uh, what's the other one? Um, treatment and plan, um, diagnostic and progress notes. What is it? Progress notes, database, progress notes, database, um, treatment and plan, and then um, progress notes, treatment and plan, problem lists. And uh, what did I say? Um, diagnostics, I believe. So, yes, that's the problem oriented medical record. SOAP is um, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. We talked about that in the last video. And then um, cheddar format, that's going to be your um, chief complaint, history, um, examination, details, drugs, um, assessment, and referral. Okay. Um, so make sure you all know make a note of that as we're going through these so just in case you see these you know and if you're on the administrator side you definitely know you need to know these um medical record types all right so let's go to the next question 
All right, which of the following appointment methods allows flexibility for the most consistent patient flow? Double booking, cluster, wave, or stream? Double booking, cluster, wave, or stream? The most consistent patient flow allows flexibility for the most consistent patient flow. All right, so I'm seeing a majority of C's. Let's see. All right, if you chose C, you're correct. So double booking is actually the opposite. Double booking is... Um, it's just a recipe for disaster because if the doctor's double booked, that means he's double booked in one slot and then he still has to see those other patients. Like, let's just say the doctor's double booked at nine o'clock. He or she still has to see his 915, 930, 945, or 10 o'clock, you know. Um, so that does not give a cons uh, um, consistent patient flow. It's going to get actually get the doctor behind. Cluster booking. Uh, we talked about that in the last couple of videos. Cluster booking is when, you know, think of a group of something, right? That means the same type of appointments are booked in the same blocks of time. So like for an example, the same, let's say the doctor is a pediatrician and she schedules all of her well child visits on Monday and Thursday mornings, right? From eight to 12. That's an example of cluster booking. Wave is the most consistent patient flow because wave, it allows the doctor you know, the hour to get caught up. So with a wave, remember several patients are scheduled at the, at the first 30 minutes of the hour and the rest of the hour is left open, right? So he may have three patients scheduled at nine o'clock. They all come in and they are seen in the order that they arrive, but the rest of the hour is left open. So he doesn't have a 9.30 and a 9.45. He has all three of them at nine o'clock and he has the whole hour to see them and do anything else he needs to do. Um, stream scheduling. Um, that is when the patients are scheduled, the, like the amount of time that they get is based on what they're coming in for, right? So a patient may get a 9 and 9.15 if they're coming in for a follow-up, um, you know, a 30-minute appointment for a physical. Um, another name for stream scheduling is fixed scheduling. That's the most common method you'll see. All right, so definitely make sure you know what all of those different scheduling methods are in case you see them, Okay. Um, and there's a modification to wave. Make sure you know what modified wave is as well, okay? All right. When preparing to use a glucometer to measure a patient's blood sugar, which of the following actions should the assistant take? Obtain a blood sample after inserting a test strip into the glucometer. Touch the testing pad on the test strip to make sure the surface is smooth. Apply the first drop of blood that appears after the puncture to the test strip. Smear the blood on the test pad. All righty, let's see. C and B. I'm seeing C and B. I see a couple of A's. All right, let's see. All right, so you're going to obtain the blood sample after inserting a test strip onto the glucometer, okay? So touch the testing pad on the test strip to make sure the surface is smooth. No, that's that doesn't really have anything to do with anything. Apply the first drop of blood. That's incorrect because we want to actually wipe away the first drop of blood. So, you know, when you guys are doing finger sticks, wipe away the first drop of blood because it's usually contaminated um, with alcohol and things like that. Um, so it's going to be obtain the blood sample after inserting the test strip. So um, the reason why you don't want to get the, the blood sample first, because if you get the blood sample first and then, then you go insert the test strip. So those of you who have used a glucometer before, before, you know, when you, in, when you insert that test strip, you have to wait until it say that it's ready. So if you, um, obtain a blood sample first, your patient's fingers just sitting there bleeding while you're trying to insert the test strip. So you want to insert it first and then obtain a blood sample, obtain the blood sample. 
And of course, you've already cleaned it off, right? And you're going to wipe away that first drop of blood once you obtain the blood sample. All right, when obtaining a rectal temperature, which of the following positions should the patient be placed in? SAMS, knee chest, lithotomy, or dorsal recumbent? SAMS, knee chest, lithotomy, or dorsal recumbent? Okay, I'm seeing majority A, I see C. All right, let's see. All right, for those of you that chose SAMS, that is correct. So SAMS you can use for um, rectal temperatures. Um, knee chest is more so like um, if you're doing like a rectal or anal exam. Um, when the doctor's on a rectal anal exam, lithotomy and dorsal recumbent are both for um, vaginal exams. Um, and dorsal recumbent can also be um, used for a rectal um, exam as well. Another important one, ladies and gentlemen, if it, I don't know if there's any gentlemen on here, but ladies, make sure you know these, um, these positions when you see them, okay? Make sure you are able to recognize these positions because you will see them on the test. All right. Um, when using a POMR, I mentioned this earlier, problem or in a medical record, those are those four sections I was trying to remember earlier. Um, where should you enter the patient's health history and lab results? Problem list, database, progress notes, diagnostic and treatment plan. Which section does health history and lab results go in? Health history and lab results. All right, I'm saying C, A, C, and I want C, C, D. Patients' health history and lab results. Another one you want to make sure you know. So if you see this, if it's on here, it's probably going to be on the test. So if you don't know these different sections of the POMR, Want to make sure you know it. Okay, let's see. I'm seeing mixed answers, so let's see. Okay, so it's going to be the database section, okay? So health history and lab results goes in the database section. Problem lists are a list of the patient's problems, their recent diagnosis, um, um, any problems that they have, high blood pressure, diabetes, right? Those Any problems at the chest pain, the problems that the patient has. Progress notes are their visits, like that's where the chief complaint will go, right? And the doctor's notes as he's seeing that patient. Diagnostic and treatment plan. That's the doctor's plans, like referrals and um, the treatment plans that the doctor um, or provider has for that patient. So make sure, go back to your book, make sure you understand those different sections of that, um, of that medical record. All right. Oh, so this is a math one. I don't like math. A medical assistant is preparing one gram per kilogram of activated charcoal for a patient who weighs 176, 176 pounds. How many grams of charcoal should the assistant prepare? And I told you all, I don't like math. So I understand if you don't either. The good thing is that as medical assistants, we don't do a lot of math, but we do have to know how to do these dosage calculations. So this is about as, as far as we go with the math, thankfully. Um, I will tell you this, you want to make sure you know how to um, make sure you go in your books and make sure you study, you know, how to um, convert, you know, convert in pounds to kilograms, kilograms to pounds and inches to feed and all that good stuff. OK, make sure you know how to do all those things because you will see questions like that. Um, Shalandra says she had them backwards. Which ones did you have backwards? Mm 
All right, let's see. I see A, D. Anybody else like me and don't like math? I cannot stand it. I don't like it. All right, let's see what we got here. Let's get let's get past this math because I'm gonna get mad. All right, so the answer is gonna be 79 grams. Now, why is it 79 grams? So, first of all, it's asking, it's saying this um, the patient is the assistant is preparing one gram per kilogram. So, for every kilogram that the patient weighs, the medical assistant has to prepare one gram. Okay, so the very first thing you always want to do is convert this um 176 pounds a kilogram so you want to convert those pounds to kilograms first of all so you guys know in the medical field we a lot of times the provider tends to go by kilograms more so than they go by pounds especially for kids um so you want to first convert that 176 in the kilograms and the way we convert that 176 to kilograms we're going to multiply 176 by 0.45 all right and let's do that, 0.45. I got my calculator here, pulled up on my other phone. So let's see, 176 divided by 0.45. I'm sorry, I said divided by, I meant multiplied by. I'm sorry, 176 times 0.45. That gives us 79.2, but we got to round that down, right? 0.2 is less than five, so we're going to round it down to 79. And because it says one kilo, one gram per kilogram, um, because the patient weighs 79 kilograms, 79 times one is 79. So that's how we got 79 grams. OK, um, so like I said, um, you do have to know how to do these dosage calculations. This was one um, uh, Steffi said me. Steffi doesn't like math either. I hate it. I'm getting ready to get mad, Steffi. I need to get past this question. But. I will say this, you definitely want to know how to, um, you know, do these doses calculations. Um, I will say this, um, when you get out there in the field, I have never worked in an office where I actually had to do this, but you want to know how to do it. You need to know how to do doses calculations as a medical assistant, period. And then also, you want to take this test, you need to know how to do it. But when you get out there, I mean, I don't want to say you'll never have to do it, but every, every doctor I've worked with have done it on themselves. Now, I can do another video maybe one day if I'm in a good mood. Just some quick dosage calculation problems. We can do that if anybody that's having issues, but it's going to be quick, maybe like five minutes. <laughs> I don't want to, you know. I mean, I teach it. Like I said, I've been teaching for um, since 2011 now. So I teach it. I just don't like it. Um, all right, let's move past this. Quick, quick, quick. Let's move past this. All right. Which of the following is a clear wave laboratory test? PAP? Blood type and a cross matching, fecal leukocyte test or HCG. And I am not. I am not. Oh, she said yes, please, Sharice. I think that's how you pronounce that, Sharice. All right, clear wave laboratory test. Alrighty, I'm saying C and D. Alrighty, let's see. If you chose D, which is um, human chorionic gonadotropin HCG test, to 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 say it um, the short way. Pregnancy test, that's a clear wave test. So let's talk about this for a moment. What are clear wave tests? Clear wave tests are those tests um, that are considered low complexity tests. They don't have to be sent over to a lab um, to be tested. Each of those other tests, the PAP test, blood typing, and fecal leukocyte tests, um, we have to send those in fecal, I mean, in feces. Like, yeah, some, in some cases, you will have to collect feces from your patient to send off to the lab. 
And you may even have to do the fecal or coat test in the office. So I don't know if you learned that in school, but yeah, you may have to collect some feces. But um, these type tests, we have to send off to the actual lab to get tested. So those are not clear way, but HCG, this is a pregnancy test. A urine, we can do that um, via um, urine right in the office. So that's a clear way test. Another example is like a strep test. So if you see a strep test as a clear way test, those are tests that we can do in the office. So anytime you see these tests that we have to send off to the lab, right, to like lab core or Quest or whatever lab you use where you live, um, those are not clear waves. So you can automatically rule those out. All right. Oh, let's see. I see somebody congratulating Marshall. What Marshall did? Let's see. Oh, Marshall says she passed. Congratulations, Marcel. Marshall. Congratulations. Which test did you take? Was it CCMA or CMAA? All right, let's go on. I think we got a few more questions. Yep, a few more questions. All right. A patient's eyes are moving back and forth in a constant and voluntary manner. What findings should this be documented as? Strabismus, nystagmus, conjunctivitis, or hordialum? Hordialum. Which of the following? is that the patient eyes are moving back and forth constant and voluntary in a constant and involuntary manner. Oh, okay, Marshall. She says, CC, make sure you, um once this video posts and you're allowed to um, comment, actually comment on it, make sure you um, post it so that way I can shout you out. I can screenshot it and shout you out in the next video. Don't forget. All right, everybody's saying B, let's see. Looks like I have an A and a D on here. Okay, let's see. I don't know if that's from the last question though. All right, let's see. Nystagmus, that is correct, nystagmus. So um, strabismus, that's more of the um, cross eyes. So uh, that's another like cross eyes. So that's when the patient's eyes do not look in the same direction. So you might hear the term being cross eyed. Um, conjunctivitis, that is actually a bacterial um, infection. It is um, contagious. Um, and then a hordelium, hordelium, that is um, like a stat on an eyelid. I don't know if you guys have ever heard, had one of those, but they're um, painful and itchy. Again, make sure you guys add this to your notes. Um, Haley says me. Not exactly sure what you meant by me, Haley. Oh, 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 you mean you've had that before? Okay, gotcha. All right. So, yeah, so make sure you add these. Your business is, what do we say? Um, cross eyed, the patient's eyes are not going in the same direction. Nystagmus, we know um, by the question what that is. Conjunctivitis is the bacteria infection. Um, and hordelium um, is a sty. Alrighty. Which of the following instruments can be sanitized and reused without needing disinfection and sterilization? Nasal specula, autoscope, carets, or suture removal instruments? Oh, hey, Katarina. She says, I'm working at a county jail in the medical department. Just finished med. I'm not exactly sure. Med. I know you said you passed your test. Congratulations, Karina. I, Katarina, I did see that. And I did. I don't know if you saw the beginning of the video. You were one of the ones that I shouted out. So congratulations. She's from Nevada. I've never heard of how they pronounce that. Is that Tanopa, Katarina? I've never heard of that. A congratulations to you as well. There's quite a few people in here tonight that have passed their test. I'm happy for you all. Okay, so I'm seeing a majority of says B. Let's see. That is correct. So um, autoscope is one of those things that you can simply sanitize. Remember we talked about sanitization earlier? Sanitization is really reducing the number of microorganisms, right? That's the that's the very first step of, you know, um, um, cleansing instruments, right? So with the autoscope, and that's the instrument that the doctors use to examine the patient's ear, right? And they and they do use covers on those. So it's not like the autoscope is going in one person's ear and it's going in another one. 
we do use cover. So in that case, they just sanitize it, meaning like they pretty much just wiping it off. Nasal specular carets, those are disinfected. Um, and then suture removal instruments. With suture removal instruments, you definitely have to sterilize those. So those are not the answers. All righty. Oh, Evelyn says she's, I, am I pronouncing that right? Evelyn says she's in Tanopa too. Is it Tanopa? All right. Um, let's see. Miss Kimion says she tests Friday and I'm praying I pass. Good luck to you, Miss Kimion. Are you taking a CCMA or CMA? Which one are you taking? You got this. Just make sure these next few days, your life revolves around the information. Continue to, um, you know, read over your study guide your practice test, whatever resources you have, just keep that stuff in front of you. All righty. Let's see. Next question. If a patient asks about the cost of a surgical procedure, which response is appropriate? Inform the patient that the, skull, that the cost will be determined after the procedure is complete. Instruct the patient to contact her insurance carrier for a price. Provide the patient with an estimated cost. Advise the patient at all procedure price and must be communicated by mail. Marshall said the videos help so much. Oh, I'm, that's so good to know, Marshall. Holly Jones said, hi, me and my friend Ashanti watch you live in Indiana. We just passed on NH on the 19th. Congratulations, Holly. So make sure you comment on the video once it posts so that way I can shout you out too. I did a uh, um, shout out Ashanti earlier. I specifically remember Ashanti um, comment and she did. Um, I, I did shout her out earlier, unless there's another Ashanti, it could be more than one, but I think I shouted her out earlier. But yeah, definitely comment on the video once it actually posts so I can screenshot it and shout you out in the next video. So people are telling you, Congratulations, Holly! Congratulations to everybody that has passed. Miss Kimion, um, Patrine says she has faith that she will pass. All right, so I'm seeing C, I see D, A, B. I'm seeing a mix of answers. And I believe this is the last question here. Yeah, this, I believe, well, uh, it may be one more question after this. All right, let's see. Provide the patient with an estimated cost. Let's talk about this one for a second because I'm seeing a lot of different um, answers. So we're not going to inform the patient that the cost will be determined after the procedure is complete. We want to give them a, a estimated cost. Okay. So um, one thing, um, the reason why you want to give an estimated cost, of course, you can't give an, an exact cost. So we can let them know, you know, on our fee schedule, this procedure costs, I should say a thousand dollars. However, we don't know how much your insurance will cover, if any at all. So this is, is this is an estimated cost, maybe about a thousand dollars. Okay. So you can always give your patients an estimate based on what the fee schedule says, okay? We're not going to just have her call an insurance company. That's not going to give them a price, right? And we're not going to advise a patient at all procedure price that must communi be communicated by mail because that's not true. We can talk to her while she's there in the office, on the phone or whatever, right? It doesn't have to be communicated by mail. All right, let's see. Oh, that it was it. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I thought it was more. I thought that said, let's see. Oh, this is it. Okay. Well, thank you to everybody that's a, that's been a part of this exam practice video. If this has been valuable, make sure you like it and subscribe if you want to see more videos. Also share with your classmates and colleagues. One thing I do have coming up, I know the majority of you are students, um, but one thing I, I want to do going forward, I want to do... Um, some interviews eventually. So if anybody is willing to do any interviews with me, make sure you email me at kheartcpr at gmail.com. Let me know for people that's working out in the field, if you've been working during COVID, I want to talk to you. Brand new MAs on externships. So in, if anybody is willing to be, you know, interviewed live on a channel on camera with me one day, let me know. I want to do some of that. I have some more videos. I have a lot more coming up. Um, so definitely look out for that. Um, Holly Jones said, make sure you pay attention. She knows that. Thank you, Holly. Oh, um, 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 cabbage, coronary artery. What is that? Bypass graph, Haley. Um, she, uh, Compa says, I only have two days left for my exam and I don't know what to study in advice. Which exam are you taking, Compa? 
You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you all for staying on, on here this long with me. I know it's been about an hour. Just make sure you guys like the video. When it posts, for those of you who pass your test, make sure you comment on the actual post so that way I'm able to screenshot it because um, I want to shout you out in the next video. And if you have any classmates or colleagues that can benefit from these videos, share it with them. One girl told me her and all her classmates you know, have been watching the videos and they pass. So definitely share it, pass it along. Um, Lizbeth said you sent me an email. Okay, Lizbeth, I'll check the email. I get a lot from you all, so I'll definitely be checking that. But like I said, I got some more stuff coming up. So look out for that. I got some interviews coming up. And um, what else? Um, this week, I'm going to be recording videos on um, what to do and not to do while on externship. I'm also going to be breaking down the differences between the CMA, CCMA, um, um, Evelyn says her CMAA exam is tomorrow. Let's send Evelyn some prayers. Evelyn, let me know as soon as you take your test tomorrow. Oh, Evelyn says she's taking hers tomorrow. Kimberly says she's taking, wow, ladies. Let's send them some prayers and good luck to those ladies. Let me know as soon as you take your test. Do some more studying tonight. Go over your um, areas that you fall short in, that you fall short in, okay? Keep this stuff in front of you until you take your test. Let your life revolve around this. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, Marshall says she shared the video with four girls. Wow. Thank you, Marshall. Tell them I said congratulations. Kimberly and Evelyn, they are telling you good luck. They're sending good vibes your way. Everybody's saying good luck to you. Wow, 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 wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and let you all go. When the, when the video actually posts, once I end this and the video posts a little bit, again, those of you that pass, make sure you comment so that way I can screenshot it and shout you out in the next video. Um, if you have any questions, you can always, um, let's see, I'm actually on YouTube from my other channel. Let me comment on here, my um, email. pi at gmail.com okay there we go there's my email ladies all right you all have a good night